join me in welcoming to the stage our first speaker tonight. Krista Crabtree has lived in the Peak to Peak area for 20 years. She is a freelance writer and the author of the engaging and educational children's book, Being Stella. Please help me welcome Krista Crabtree to the stage. The Mentor and the Muse. The Mentor and the Muse. Are they like food and water to the writer or artist? Are they necessary for nourishment of the craft? History certain, certainly illustrates that many great writers and artists had both. But what if you are your own true mentor and your mind holds the key to discovering your muse? What if all that creative power is in your hands and not necessarily in the hands of someone else? How do you find your inner mentor and muse in order to access what the writer Joyce Carol Oates called the joyful exercise of the imagination? These are some of the questions that I'd like to explore here. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the etymology or origin of the word mentor comes from the Greek name mentor, the name of the advisor Odysseus' son Telemachus in Homer's Odyssey had. Not only did Mentor advise the young Telemachus, but later the goddess Athena visited Telemachus in the form of Mentor to advise him on how to fight off the suitors of his mother while his father was away at war. The word Mentor was adopted into Latin, French, and English and came to mean trusted advisor, friend, teacher, and wise person who imparts wisdom. Also interesting to note is that the root of men refers to states of mind or thought, and further down this rabbit hole, it's possibly a derivative of the Sanskrit word for manas, for mind and spirit, or muna, for sage and seer. I like to think that the root of the word mentor began with thought, and the thought created a word that means to be in the state of thought, and that comes from within. So that the thought advises a writer or an artist to nurture the flower of an idea. What is life but the angle of vision, asked Ralph Waldo Emerson, the leader of the transcendentalist movement, and by the way, a mentor to Henry David Thoreau. Wisdom is like electricity, he said. There is no permanent wise man or woman, but man capable of wisdom, who being put into certain company or other favorable conditions, became wise as glasses rubbed acquire power for a time. I love stories about mentors and I always wanted one. Ram Das, the psychologist, spiritual leader and writer of such books as Be Here Now, had many mentors, including a guru named Maharaji. After meeting Maharaji, Ram Das published his book about his spiritual journey, which went on to sell two million copies since he first published it in the 70s while living in a spiritual community in Taos, New Mexico. The poet and editor Ezra Pound mentored T.S. Eliot and advocated to publish the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock in Poetry Magazine. Pound worked with Eliot on The Wasteland and was thanked by Eliot in the poem's dedication. The writer and teacher Joyce Carol Oates was so taken by the writer, writing of her student Jonathan Safran Foer, who wrote the best-selling book Everything is Illuminated, that she wrote a letter to his parents telling them about his immense talent. Because of Oates' mentorship, Thor became a writing teacher as well. There are many, many more examples of profound mentor-mentee relationships, but do you need to put all of your trust, hopes, desires in the hands of someone else to be a successful writer or artist? I think the first step is to be educated in the craft of your chosen artistic expression, and a big part of that comes from teachers arguably both good and bad ones. It also comes from observing the work of other writers and artists. I've never had a bona fide mentor, but I've had a lot of teachers, like Elizabeth, an artist in residence at my middle school, and Rob, a poet and my thesis advisor in college. They were the most positive influencers. Sadly, some of the methods of, of teaching methods of people in my life have not always been pleasant. 
When I was an intern at Ski Magazine, there was a Swiss-German editor who yelled at me for not linking and connecting my paragraphs. I cried after that. Then I printed out the article, I cut up the paragraphs old school style, and I looked at how the order could be more logical and coherent. I learned that each point or paragraph should have some connection to the preceding one and the one that follows. I later had a boss tell a friend of mine on a chairlift that I had a lot to learn. I was upset when I heard that, but he was right. I did and I still do have a lot to learn. I spend a lot of time reading and admiring art, and therefore the artwork or piece of writing becomes my mentor, lean, leaning them on the, leaning then on the definition of mentor as pertaining to thought that imparts some wisdom. Okay, so you learn your craft and how to make art. Now, where do the ideas come from? Well, if you're like Walt Whitman, another writer and transcendentalist and nature lover, then you lean and you loaf at your ease, observing a spear of summer grass. In his epic poem, Song of Myself, it's clear that Whitman found his muse in nature, and I love the line, I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. The naturalist and preservationist John Muir, also known as John of the Mountains, said, wilderness is a necessity. And for me, it is a necessity because that's where I think best. Many writers and artists famously had human muses, which makes for very romantic stories. F. Scott Fitzgerald had his wife, Zelda, who allegedly inspired parts of the great Gatsby. Jack Kerouac had Neil Cassidy, thinly veiled as Dean Moriarty in On the Road. Jane Austen loved Tom Lefroy, and the unrequited love probably inspired parts of Pride and Prejudice. Dante had Beatrice, who's, who appears as one of his guides in the Divine Comedy. The surrealist Salvador Dali had Elena, who, also known as Gala, his wife, and herself an artist. Rodin, who sculpted The Thinker, had Camille Claudel, who was his assistant and muse. But as a sculptor herself, were they muses for each other? Vermeer had the girl with the pearl earring, and Picasso, well, Picasso had multiple muses, <laughs> such as Marie Therese Walter, who inspired more of his paintings than any other woman. The word muse can be used as both a noun and a verb. To muse, according to the online entomology dictionary, means to reflect, ponder, meditate, to be absorbed in thought. The 12th century French word muse is thought to literally mean to stand with one's nose in the air, or possibly to sniff about like a dog who has lost the scent. <laughs> muse as a noun comes from one of the nine muses of classical mythology, the daughters of Zeus and Mnemosyne, protectors of the arts. Mnemosyne is derived from the word mnemonic, which means remembrance of memory. Muse is most likely derived from the Latin word musa and the Greek word mosa, meaning music or song. It makes me think about how strong our memories are of great music and art. Today, muse is defined as a person or a personified force that is the source of inspiration for an artist. I prefer to take the meaning of muse as the force and not a person that provides the source of inspiration. Last year, for example, in Florence, Italy, my family and I arrived to beat the crowds, arrived early to beat the crowds at the Galleria dell'Accademia to see Michelangelo's David. We entered through the hall of the prisoners, past four or five sculptures called the Slaves, earlier works by Michelangelo that seemed to struggle out of the marble they were carved in. And then, incredibly tall, under a circular skylight, stands David. My throat caught, and tears welled up in my eyes. I was overcome <coughs> at how magnificent it was. Not just the set and the setting, but the artistry, the scale, and the beauty. That was extremely memorable and visceral feeling I had that I felt from art. And if you close your eyes, I'm sure that you could recall a similar feeling too. The next question then is, how do you know if art is good? Well, Emily Dickinson, Emily Dickinson said, 
If I phys feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. Many artists and art lovers feel a visceral reaction to the art that they love. It's what makes you pause in front of a painting to really feel it deeply. It's what causes you to reread a line in a book or a poem. It's what makes your eyes tear up when you're tear up when you're listening to evocative music. It would be very stimulating to live in an ecstatic reality of losing the top of your head. But I think contemplation is where a lot of ideas percolate. I realize that I think very clearly and openly when walking through the woods. There's a practice in Japan called Shinrin Yoku and it really, it's called Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing, which literally translates to taking in the forest. Among the benefits, according to practitioners, are relaxation, connections with nature, and perhaps reaching new insights. I spent my childhood playing among the birches and hardwood trees of New Hampshire. Think of Robert Frost's line, one could do worse than be a swinger of birches, and you get the picture. For me, those times of playing, imagining, observing, and connecting with the natural world is where I stood with my nose in the air and sniffed about, or first began to reflect, ponder, and meditate. Developing my muse meant being quiet enough to listen to it. I haven't written my magnum opus yet. I have written two theses full of poetry, 20 years worth of magazine and website articles, and two children's books. What I realize is that creating art is about trusting your instincts and accessing those lessons or feelings that imprinted something in you during your life journey. You don't need a physical muse as a good luck charm or a source of inspiration, though someone or something could provide that for you. But know that you could listen to the inner mentor that has the power to literally or figuratively knock the top of your head off. I think that the mentor is the voice and the muse is the object, the person, place, or thing that gives you a visceral feeling and compels you to create. Essentially, it's the splinter in the creative part of your brain that keeps festering until you itch it and express that idea. Though I love stories of mentors and muses, I didn't have any in mythic proportions no guru or charismatic leader, no jilted lover, not even a professor who wrote to my parents to tell them what a genius I was. <laughs> but I did have some inspirational writers in my life. I always had a voracious appetite for books and a fondness for art and music. Otherwise, it's been the trees and me, and I've been leaning and loafing in the forest my whole life.